Over the past week or so, I have had a lot of people tag me in or send me videos like this asking if this is the first ever footage of Israel's iron beam in action. Now, if you're not familiar with the iron beam, it is a very real directed energy or laser air defense system in development with Israeli-based Rafael advanced defense systems. And in the not too distant future, it very likely will be shooting down rockets and mortars, a lot like this footage alleges, except for one problem. When you see clips like that one or this one that's already got almost 6 million views on Twitter or X alleging to show the iron beam, you should know that actual directed energy or laser weapons do not create any visible beam of light. That's your first indicator that these clips are fake. Well, technically, that first one was of a real iron dome intercept with just a lens flare creating a light in the camera's field of view. The second one, however, is just footage from the video game Arma 3. But what about the real iron beam? How capable is it really, and what will it be able to do when it does see combat, potentially within just the next few days? Let's quickly dive into what this system is and how it stacks up compared to other laser systems that are already in service around the world. The Iron Beam is a 100 kilowatt class high energy laser weapon system, or HELWS, and it's designed to supplement, but not replace, Israel's highly touted Iron Dome air defense system. Now, the Iron Dome is actually just one third of a three layered air defense apparatus that Israel uses to defend against a wide variety of airborne threats. Israel uses a system called Arrow for high altitude, long range threats like ballistic missiles, a system called David Sling for more intermediate range threats and things like cruise missiles, and the Iron Dome for short range attacks from things like mortars and rockets. Now that is a very important distinction because the Iron Dome is often compared to systems like the MIM-104 Patriot, which my friend Habitual Line Crosser can teach you all about. But the Patriot air defense system is designed to take on very different threats than the Iron Dome. A Patriot system wouldn't bother trying to intercept a mortar, whereas the Iron Dome specializes in it. Likewise, the Iron Dome wouldn't try to intercept a ballistic missile, and that's the Patriot's bread and butter. Now, the Iron Dome is an incredibly capable system, and one of the things it does best is knowing when not to intercept a mortar or a rocket because it doesn't actually pose a threat to any Israeli personnel or property. But nonetheless, even when you only intercept the rockets or mortars that you have to, it is not a very cost-effective approach. Some of the rockets and mortars Hamas is launching at Israel only cost about 300 bucks a piece, whereas every one of the Tamir missiles that the Iron Dome uses to intercept them costs somewhere between 30 and $100,000 each. Now that's not that big of a deal when they are limited attacks, but under concerted, consistent attacks, as we've seen in recent weeks, that becomes a real cost problem. Now, the Iron Beam can really help with this because according to the Congressional Research Service, every laser intercept will only cost between $1 and $10 in terms of power output. But there are a number of other real big benefits to using lasers for short-range defense like this, one of the biggest ones being depth of magazine. Today, Israel maintains at least 10 complete Iron Dome batteries each of which has three or four launchers, and each of those launchers can hold 20 Tamir interceptor missiles. Now, each of these batteries can protect up to around 60 square miles, which gives Israel the ability to cover about 600 square miles in protection from the Iron Dome. But those interceptors do run out, and then you're stuck reloading your Iron Dome batteries, creating vulnerabilities in your protective net. Lasers, on the other hand, don't run out of ammo as long as you can keep putting juice into them. And as a result, their depth of magazine is practically limitless. But as good as lasers do sound for air defense, they also come with some significant shortcomings, and the Iron Beam is no exception. The first limitation the Iron Beam is facing before it even sees the fight is power output. As a 100 kilowatt class weapon, it is more powerful than many of the lasers we've already seen fielded by US Navy ships or Chinese Navy ships, for instance. But it is nowhere near as powerful as the air defense lasers in development right now that 
are headed towards service in the not too distant future. There are no universally accepted metrics for how powerful a laser needs to be for different defensive needs, but the Congressional Research Service has broken down a general rule of thumb. 100 kilowatts is enough to take down a rocket, a mortar, maybe even some small drones. 300 kilowatts might be able to take out drone boats or even burn through the side of a cruise missile as it flies by. And you'd need at least 1,000 kilowatts or one megawatt to be able to take down a ballistic missile or hypersonic missile as it heads straight for you. And even then, there are no guarantees. But power output isn't the only concern here. We also have to worry about other limitations that are just universal to lasers, and it's why the iron beam is a logical application for laser defenses, whereas doing things like stopping ballistic missiles or hypersonic missiles are pretty unlikely. The first and most basic one is just that lasers need direct line of sight in order to engage a target, but that's no big deal for short-range defense. It only becomes a problem when you try to engage targets at longer range. You also need incredibly precise beam control because the way a laser engages a target is by transferring heat into that target, and it takes time to burn through. In fact, a few years ago, the U.S. Navy conducted a test with a 150-kilowatt laser, about 50% more powerful than the iron beam, and it took about 15 seconds of sustained fire to burn through a small airborne drone. In other words, 100 to 150 kilowatts just isn't going to zap things out of existence. It may take a minute to burn through them. And in order to do that, you need very precise beam control to keep that beam hitting the exact same point on a target as it moves through the sky. The less commonly understood limitations of these laser systems are atmospheric scattering and thermal blooming. Now, atmospheric scattering is a phrase we use to describe the way pollution, dust, sand, and other things in the air can just scatter a laser beam on its way to a target. Now, this can dramatically reduce the amount of power that the laser can actually put onto the target, reducing its efficacy and potentially letting that target, missile, rocket, mortar, or whatever it may be, come straight on through. The other problem, thermal blooming, comes from using a laser in one exact direction for a prolonged period of time. As you do that, the laser beam itself superheats the air it's passing through, which creates a bit of a lens effect that shifts the laser beam off of target. And you need a computer that can compensate for that, and it isn't always possible. Now, these aren't really problems for the iron beam, however, because it is intended as a close-range system. And truth be told, that's really the only practical application for lasers as far as today's technology is concerned. Because of things like atmospheric scattering and thermal blooming and the like, right now, the furthest a laser can really be effective is about a mile, and even the most optimistic projections say that they may only work for about five miles, and as a result, they basically won't ever be very effective against attacks from things like hypersonic missiles. The missile will just close that gap so much faster than the laser could burn through it. Now, lasers really can be used at much longer ranges, just not really to burn through a target. Instead, you can use them to blind or dazzle, as people often say, the optical sensors on all sorts of systems, from satellites to missiles to aircraft and more. But you're not going to shoot any of those things down with a laser covering hundreds or thousands of miles. Now, the U.S. Navy fielded its first laser weapon system back in 2014 with the 33-kilowatt-class ANSEQ-3 Laser Weapon System, or LAWS, and that was really intended to serve as a dazzler. In 2019, the Navy fielded its 60-kilowatt Helios system, which stands for High Energy Laser with Integrated Optical Dazzler and Surveillance System. Now, the Navy believes that they could ramp up the Helios system up to 150 kilowatts, which would make it a fairly effective point defense system against short-range attacks. But they already have plans to start testing their Hellcap, or High Energy Laser Counter Anti-Cruise Missile System, next year, and that will be a 300 kilowatt system. Now, not all of America's lasers have been fielded on warships, of course. Back in 2021, for instance, Lockheed Martin delivered the 60-kilowatt-class airborne high-energy laser to the U.S. Air Force for duty aboard its AC-130 Ghost Rider gunships. 
the Air Force intends to ramp that system up to 100 kilowatts before it sees combat. Not to leave the Army out of it, last year Lockheed Martin delivered to them the most powerful laser system ever publicly disclosed to date, the Indirect Fires Protection Capability High Energy Laser, which is an even tougher acronym at IFPC-HEL. Regardless, this is a 300 kilowatt system that's already in testing today, and Lockheed Martin announced plans just recently to field a 500 kilowatt version that we'll see testing in the not too distant future. Now, the US is obviously not the only other nation in addition to Israel fielding lasers. Back in 2019, Russia announced that their Perezvet system was in service, though to date there's been no word on its actual power output. It seems as though it is intended to be a satellite dazzler, but it might have enough power to be a point defense system against small Small targets like rockets or drones as well. And just a few months ago, China unveiled their 30 kilowatt LW30, which is a mobile road-based laser air defense system designed to take out small drones like quadcopters. At the end of the day, lasers really are the future of air defense, at least in certain applications, like against drone swarms, for instance, thanks to their depth of magazine, low cost of operation, and the ability to engage targets at the speed of light. But the very real technical limitations with today's solid state laser technology, and maybe even lasers in general, mean we're still a long way away, if ever, from lasers being the all-purpose solution to incoming air threats. And even when Iron Beam comes online, which is likely to happen in the very near future, it is only intended to supplement the Iron Dome, not replace it. Laser defense systems just are not at a point yet where we can rely on them in place of the kinetic intercept systems that we're accustomed to today. But this technology is rapidly advancing. In fact, I would argue it's advancing faster now than ever before. And if there's one thing I've learned about defense technology in my years covering it, it's that we really can never say never. So is the iron beam depicted in these videos? No, but will the Iron Beam very likely be taking down rockets and mortars over Israel in the not-too-distant future? Well, the answer to that is yes.